What a what a what an amazing um we just concluded our our morning ah, conversation service. What an amazing time we had. What an amazing time we had. And um so so this is sort of a part two, I guess, to um what I shared earlier. And I wanted to come back uh and, and do this live because I, I want to bring the word to you because there was such a liberty that came this morning as I shared this word and it, it just isn't fair um to leave it with a few. Um because of what the Holy Spirit did on this day of Pentecost of, of all days. And so I'm not going to preach the entire message to you, but I, I want to share with you some of the truth that came out of the message today that I pray that as the Holy Spirit anointed those moments and those truths and those promises to us, I, I pray that they will encourage you and I pray that those same truths will set you free. It's, it's not truth alone that sets you free. It's the knowledge of truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I pray that the knowing of this truth today will set you free. And so I've been in this series um, on, on rethinking judgment um, and over the last s several weeks and, you know, just sort of talking through where did judgment begin? And so I just encourage you, I don't even know how I'm, I, I, because I, I don't think we, I recorded these messages in particular, but I know I posted them or posted, made posts online about them. But we've been in this series for the last maybe four to five weeks on rethinking judgment. And where did judgment begin? And why is it that we judge other people? And why is it that, and because it sort of, I built it on three, on, on three legs, I guess, maybe. And that is the way that we judge others and why we judge others. And then we talked about how we, we, we judge God because Sarah judged him to be faithful who promised. And because she judged him to be faithful, because so all of us will judge God because the way you judge God will determine how you live your life. Right. It's how you will live your faith, because if you if you judge God to be angry, then your faith will be angry. If you judge God to be gracious, your faith is gracious. Your life is gracious. And so the way that you you judge God is based on it's not it's it's really where do you base your, your judgments of God? So Sarah in Hebrews, she judged him to be faithful. And as a result of her judging him to be faithful, who promised she she was she literally gave life to to the family of God. Everything that God said to Abraham was fulfilled, you know, because she believed God who was faithful. So she judged him to be faithful. So we started talking about the way we judge God and how we see him and how we judge him. And, and based on that judgment is how we live our life. The series began with the way we judge others and why we judge others. We went back to Genesis chapter 3. And that's where the original sin began. And that's where judgment began. Because the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they, when they sinned was they actually judged themselves. They judged themselves to be naked. And God had to come back and said, who told you you were naked? And they said, we're naked, we're afraid, so we hid. And so that is always the response to human sin. Shame, fear, blame. They, they were ashamed, so they hid, they were afraid, and then they blamed God, or they blamed, Adam literally blamed God, the woman, it was the woman you gave me, and then Eve blamed the serpent. So always the, the response to human sin, the first responses to human sin is shame, fear, and blame. And so we, we talk through all of that, and, and again, the beauty of, of how we how we see God. So many of us have grown up with a faith where we, when, when God, when we think about Genesis 3 and we think about the story and how they were banished from the Garden of Eden. And I've shared some of that. Actually, it's not true. I actually did go online and because I remember we recorded in the place where we were before here and then I would upload it. But, but today we talked about judging ourselves. So we, we talked about judging others and then we talked about judging God. And now I want to just take a few moments and talk to you about the way we judge ourselves. And so let me come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be long winded in this. I want to get to the point. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 through 5, Paul makes this profound revelation. Or shares this, he says, I care very little if I'm judged by you 
or by any human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. And this is so powerful, I don't even judge myself. He says, for my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judging, he says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time until the Lord comes. And he will bring light to what is hidden in darkness and will exp expose the motives of the human heart. So we've talked this through, right? We've talked this through, this whole process of you and I, the moment we judge others, we literally, we elevate ourselves to a godlike status because we think we know the motive of people's hearts and we don't. And we talked we talked it in, we thoroughly talked through all of that, that we're not God. And we talked about the way we judge others and we, the way we, we judge God, but I, I want to address this because sometimes what we don't address is the way we judge ourselves. Because judging ourselves is not only foolish, it's as harmful as the origin, it, it is literally the essence of sin itself. Every time we judge ourselves, we are going back to the garden, to the original, sort of that in, original story in creation. And so, so I, we have to look to Jesus, and, and that's what I want to do. And, and I, I, I just, I want to be so very careful to honor the Holy Spirit in a moment like this. So you, I hope you, you hear the passion within my voice because there's a fire on, on the inside of me because of what the Lord just did here. So, so our, our perfect example, we have to turn to Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. So in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, we read the story of, of we see the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We're talking again about judging ourselves. And so you know in the story in Matthew 4 that this is the story where Jesus is led in by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And there's all these temptations that are that are given that Jesus experiences when the the devil you know tempts him with this and that and he says you know the bread and the stone and he's, he's telling him all the things and he says to him in in verse six he says you know if you're the son of God jump off you know jump off this and this where the scripture says that he gives order his he gives his angels order to protect you and that they will hold you up in their hands so that you don't even hurt your foot on a stone and Jesus responded the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Verse 8, then he said, Next the devil took him up to the peak of the, a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says, I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. And Jesus said, Get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away, and the angels came and ministered, or they came and they, and they took care of him. And so, so, so there's these temp these three major temptations in Jesus's life that these were these were these were critical personal battles that he that he literally had to fight through and win for Jesus to fulfill his calling. I want you to hear what I just said. He had to deal with these three temptations in particular. I want to address this last one, where he was tempted because the, the, the last temptation is he says. The devil takes him up to a high mountain and says, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, and their glory. And he says, listen, if you will simply bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of this. If Jesus did not know who he was, and if Jesus would have judged himself wrongly, this story would have been very different. And so this temptation that I want to focus on is the temptation to judge Jesus judged him if he if Jesus would have judged himself insufficient for the task that he was sent to do and so the devil then offers him and he says listen all the kingdoms of the world he said if you if Jesus would simply worship this was the test where he him now he's going to have to trust He's going to have to trust his relationship with his heavenly father. He's going to have to trust who he is in the father. Remember, Jesus was the son of man, then the son of God. That's why you read in scripture prior to the resurrection, Jesus Christ. After the resurrection, Christ Jesus. First, Jesus, son of man, son of God. Then after the resurrection, son of God, son of man. 
So everything that Jesus endured in Jesus Christ, he endured first as the Son of Man, you, the human just like you and me. All right, so I want to move forward with this, and this is why. So Jesus, if he, if he would have in that moment doubted who he was, because again, we go from his life 0 to 12, and in, from 0 to 12, we see the story, and even at the age of 12, Luke chapter 2 tells us that he was in the synagogue and he was teaching. So much so that his mother, his mother and father forget that they left him there. And for three days, Jesus sits with these teachers and they're asking him questions for three days. They forget their son for three days. He's 12 years old and he's teaching. So we've got these, we got these moments in Jesus's life. He's 12 and he's teaching in the temple and they're asking him questions and he's responding and then his mom and dad come back and say where we've been searching for you where have you been and he said wait as if this is my fault you forget me you forget that i'm i you left me i didn't leave you i'm here and i'm doing exactly what i'm called to do listen to me he said i'm here doing exact at the age of 12 i'm here doing exactly what what did you think where did you think i would be he said i'm about my father's house i'm about doing my what god my father has called me to at the age of 12. then there's an 18 year silence an 18 year of preparation until we come into Mark, into Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus goes into them, into the wilderness. He's he literally led by the Spirit into the wilderness to become empowered with, with the presence of God and the Holy Spirit for ministry to begin. For the next, this next duration of his life. So here he is. So, so here's my point to you. Jesus, the temptation to judge himself insufficient for the task, he would have never fulfilled it. And so if, if, if he were insecure, this is why judging yourself is so critical that we don't do it because it is, a, it is literally as harmful as the original sin. It is as harmful as judging others. It is as harmful as judging God. The way we judged our, the way we judge ourselves. So if he was insecure, if Jesus was doubting, judging, if he was judging himself to be anything less than the savior of the world, he would have given into that. He would have literally given into that temptation. And so, you, you know, you, you press through and, and you go through, you know, he comes out of the Matthew 4 experience. And so, you know, he's 12 years old. He, he's dealing with, he's teaching, he's teaching in the synagogue and literally his parents forget him. And he's, and there says, we're searching for you. And he says, did you not know I'm about my father's house? I, I'm on a mission. Because I know who I am. And I know my purpose. And, and I hope you're going to get the essence of everything that took place in the last hour here. And here's the point of all of this. How you judge yourself will determine the outcome of your life. And had Jesus, for a moment, judged himself insufficient, unable. Had he judged himself un, 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 unable to fulfill the call or the mission, this, everything would have changed. The whole story would have had a different ending. Jesus was as subject to vulnerability as you and I were. He's, he was as subject as to, as to vulnerability as any of us. And, and, and I'm sure he must have doubted so much so. So we move forward now. I want to fast forward for, for, for this purpose. I want to fast forward to the Garden of Gethsemane. So had he doubted for a moment who he was, had he judged himself differently than the way that the father saw him? His knowledge was, was a matter of faith. His knowledge was not only a matter of faith, it was, it was demonstrated in the way he lived his life. And I'm sure there must have been times where Jesus must have questioned everything that he, he, he was enduring in the moment because he, again, he's still human. Even his, his, even his mother and father forgetting him in the temple. And so, 18 years later, when Satan promised to bring the world to his feet, Jesus was offered a guarantee of success where he might have felt, especially when he felt uncertain. Again, think about it. 
he's, he goes into that wilderness and he's, mal, he's malnourished. He's, he's, he's not eating, he's not drinking. So you can imagine the, the attack on the mind when you go, not forget, forget 40 days, when you go three or four days without eating or drinking. And so again, in, in this tremendous show of faith, Jesus re rejects the enemy's temptation. He rejects the enemy's offerings to him. And here's my point. Any person, you and I, I'm going to speak to you. I'm not going to speak to any person. I want to speak to you. Because of God's calling on your life, I'm going to come back to this really strong. Any person with the calling of God must judge themselves able to fulfill it. This is why this is so critical on how not only do you judge others, but how, not only how you judge God, but how you judge yourself and the self-judgments that you make about you. Because if you begin to question the call of God on your life, if you begin to believe the naysayers and the negativity, you may never step into the fulfillment of that calling. So any person with the calling of God must judge themselves able to fulfill it because in the power and the strength of the one who called them, they will fulfill it or because they don't believe God called them because they believe the lies. And we know that the, that the enemy is the father of lies. You will either succeed or fail on how you judge yourself. And if God has called you, if God has placed a calling on your life and you believe that what God said about you is true, no matter what the temptations are, no matter what the struggles are, no matter the darkest of seasons, no matter the darkest of night, because you have judged him to be faithful who promised, God will bring about the fulfillment of that calling on your life come hell or high water. It isn't necessarily what the enemy is speaking to you that causes you to walk away or stray. It is what you believe about yourself. Jesus at the age of 12 as a child was teaching in the synagogue, parents forgetting him, but he knew why he was there. When he goes, it, then literally 18 years later, he steps into the wilderness to be tempted of, from, by Lucifer, by Satan himself, and he knew who he was, and he said, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written, and he left that wilderness to be literally empowered by the Spirit of God for the rest of his life, to do the ministry. I'm going to come back to this. I feel strong about this. If God has called you, no man can stop you. No situation can stop you. No circumstance can stop you. Because the giftings and the callings of God are irrevocable. That means it is a matter of how you believe and how you judge yourself. That's why self-judgment is a dream killer. That's why self-judgment literally is where mercy stops. The way you judge yourself and the way the things that you say about yourself or what you allow other people to say about you literally can cripple you in your, in your journey with God. Don't allow that to happen. So let's move forward. The Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus, literally, I'm, I'm, I am sure he must have battled so much so that for he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says to the guys, I want you to come with me. Because this is now coming to the end of his life, or like his life on earth. He's about to face the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. I can't imagine the stress. I can't imagine the mental anguish that literally the Bible says that when he, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he was praying, literally it, his sweat became drops of blood. So you can imagine the internal pain. The internal battle that he would say to the father three times. This is in Matthew 26. You can turn to it at another time. In Matthew 26, you can read the whole thing from verses uh, 32 to 36. And so he's, he's in the garden of Gethsemane. He's wrestling. And, and again, if we skip, if we skip this whole scene, we won't see the fruit. We won't see the fulfillment of all that preparation from 12 and, and then at 18. And, and here he is now. He's coming to the end. And he's saying to the guys, listen, I, I want you to come with me and I just, just sit here a while, just sit here a while, just sit here while I pray. 
And so he takes Peter, James, and John along with him. And, and listen, it says, And he began to be d- deeply distressed and troubled. I can't imagine the anguish. And he said, My soul of- is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, Stay here and keep watch. He says, going a little further, he fell to the crown and he prayed. And he's literally, he's, he's praying this and he says, if, if, Father, Abba, Father, is it, is it possible? Is it possible for this cup to pass from me? And he says it three times. And on the third time he says, not my will, but your will. And so in those darkest of moments, in, that, in, that, in, in those dark hours, Jesus becomes embroiled in the same battle that he had fought in the wilderness, but now this is an internal one. He fights Lucifer and all of the other, you know, you, if, if you do this, I'll give you that. If you do this, I'll give you that. And now there's this internal battle because now he's alone. And the guys are praying, but some of them are sleeping. And he's literally in this anguish where he's, he's sweating drops of blood. And I think about just the, the, the fact that he knows now that he's about to face the cross and he, he's about to take on the sins of the world. And he, and he says in this desperate cry, Father, is there any other way around this? Is there any other way for me to get through this without this final thing? And with no response, he says, not my will, but your will be done. The worst torment of the cross wasn't the pain that Jesus endured with the whipping and the nails. I believe the worst torment on the cross was that Jesus became sin, which is human brokenness. The perfect Lamb of God became the state and the sum of all human harm. This is why Paul said, and I'm about to wrap this up, This is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, listen, God, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we become the righteousness of God in Christ. What is Paul saying? He's saying if you lived the most perfect life, even in the most perfect life, even in the holiest of ways, your sin, your life is still as filthy rags before him. You can't depend on your perfections. You've got to literally depend on his righteousness. And he says, listen, God, he took Jesus who knew no sin, his own son, to become sin for us for this reason, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so ultimately, Jesus refused to give, him, to give himself into self-judgment. And, and, and when he bowed his head to, to his father, and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Listen, this is the lesson here. There's a lesson here for all of us, and that is this. If God has called you to do it, if God has called you to do it, he will empower you to complete the work that he's given. Whether that is on a mountain, whether that's in a synagogue, whether that is on a cross. If God has called you, if God has anointed you, if God has chosen you, God will empower you to finish what he started. No matter the circumstances, no matter the people, no matter the naysayers, no matter the negativity, no matter the attacks, no matter the situations, no matter the judgments, if God has called you, what you have to believe is like Sarah. And Sarah believed. She judged him to be faithful who promised. Yeah, there's a passion in my voice. How many more years are you going to throw away? How many more years are you going to throw away? How much longer are you going to take a seat because somebody says you can't do it? Listen to me. Please listen from my heart. Jesus goes before us in everything, right? We know that to be true from the book of Hebrews. He is our perfect example in devotion. 
He's our perfect example. He's our perfect example in power. He's our perfect example in obedience. He's our perfect example in love. And in his approach to judgment, he's also our perfect example, including the judgment of self. Self judgment is a dream killer. Self judgment, those judgments literally are going, our lives are shaped by those perceptions. Our lives are shaped by the judgments that we make. Self-judgment literally keeps us from receiving mercy. Self-judgment keeps us from making friends. Self-judgment keeps us from fitting in and from contributing and from belonging. Because it's that little voice. This is where my passion kicked in earlier. It's that little voice that says, I'm not good enough. And that little voice is a liar. That little voice is louder than the voice you speak with. Because that little voice says, I'm not good enough. That little voice, listen, that is your deceptive enemy. It isn't all the voices you hear from the outside. It is that inner voice, that little voice that says, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. It's that little voice that says, you got too much against you. You've sinned too many times. You've, 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 you've lived this way too long. It's that little voice that says, you see, that's the voice that you've got to shut down. That's the voice that you've got to say, I rebuke you, get thee behind me. You see, it's self-judgment that keeps us from doing what God's called us to do. This is why it is so important, because we've judged ourselves too harshly. Some of you haven't forgiven yourself for what, what took place years ago. It is time to forgive yourself, and it is time to stop it is time to stop judging yourself. That's why Paul said, I don't care about your judgments. I don't care how you judge me. I don't care about even how, the, how human opinion or the human court judges me. He said, because the Lord is my judge. He said, I don't even judge myself. What a, what a, what a powerful statement of freedom. I don't even judge myself. You know why? Because the Lord is my judge. I don't need you to judge me. I don't need to judge myself because I have a, a God who judges me. I want to encourage you. If you don't feel like you're good enough, the truth is you'll never be. In yourself, you'll never be good enough. But you're good enough for God to have dreamt about you. You're good enough that not only did He dream about you, but He actually called you. He actually chose you. You're good enough that you were literally were the subject of His divine love. You're good enough that you're actually the pearl of great prize. You are the, the, the treasured lost coin. You're the sheep that went astray. You're good enough that he left the 99 to come after you. He called you. And because he called you, he appointed you, and he anointed you. And I want you to know something. The work that he started in you, he will finish. He will finish. You simply have to surrender your life to Him. You've got to surrender your life and you have to yield your life to His plan. You're good enough to call. You're good enough to be chosen. You're good enough to have a place and literally a place in the body of Christ to be a member of God's divine family. You're good enough to have a place, literally your own place in heaven, a place prepared for you by Jesus and the Father. Yeah, you're good enough. Yeah, you're good enough. I want you to hear me. Yeah, you're good enough. You may not think you're good enough. People may not think you're good enough. But God says you're good enough because I chose you. And I knew everything about you before you were ever born. Read Jeremiah 1. He anointed you in your mother's womb. That's why you're born. That's why you were in your mother's womb because He chose you before that. So don't tell me you're not good enough. You're good enough that He chose you. You're good enough that He literally anointed your head with fresh oil you're good enough you're good enough to sit at the master's table you're good enough 
to feast at the table. You're good enough to have that anointing oil poured over your head. You're good enough that for goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life. You're good enough. You're good enough. I want you to hear me. You're good enough. I'm not yelling. I am passionate. I am so tired of the enemy's lies. I'm so tired of the enemy lying to God's people saying you're not good enough. You're not good enough because you had an abortion. You're not good enough because you were raped. You're not good enough because you live a life in depression. You're not good enough because you've got this against you. You've got that against you. You've got that mark and that mark and that mark and that mark. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Everybody might tell you you're not good enough and you might even tell yourself that you're, good, you're not good enough, but I'm here to tell you, you are. Because... That's what this Bible is all about. To tell you and me, in yourself, you're not good enough. And I think about all the self-help books and all of the, yeah, that's fine. But you know what? There's this book. The book. And what this book says about me and what this book says about you is enough. It's whether you believe it or not. So I want you to know, you are the joy you are the joy that was set before him before he went to the cross. Think about that for just a second. You are the joy that was set before him when he went to the cross. You and I is what he saw before he endured that pain and said, it's worth it. I see them coming. It's worth it. They are worth all of this. Yeah, you are. You're worth it. So what judgments have you hemmed yourself with? In what ways have you doubted yourself or even sabotaged your opportunities? I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to let go of those thoughts. I want to encourage you to even if you have to grieve the loss of what you're having to let go of because some, some, some of these things are memories that you've walked and you've lived in for years. Because here's the thing, you, you actually can't heal what you don't allow yourself to feel. And so it's okay to feel them, but it's not okay to stay in that feeling. It's time to forgive yourself. It's time to forgive yourself for whatever role or part you played in those setbacks in your life. And it's time to stop judging yourself. Not only is it time to stop judging other people and stop judging God, but it's actually time for you to stop judging yourself. You see, God promised you and I a life. And I promise you that you are good enough because He chose you. Yeah, we've all got marks and we've all got crap we deal with and we all got issues. But greater is He that is in you. Do you hear me? Greater is He that is in you than he that's in this world. And greater is the plans that God has for you than your plans and all the plans the enemy might have for you. So it is a good day on this day that we celebrate Pentecost for you to allow the Holy Spirit to do a work inside of you. It's amazing. Earlier on, when we started the service, as I was praying, I saw, I, saw, I just saw it, so I'm, I'm going to try. I didn't even share it with the, the people during the service, but, but I prayed it, and I saw pages in a book being burned there was a fire being lit to certain pages and those pages represented the past but then 
I saw on a different set of pages a light, and we we're uh, literally it was the whole thing about Pentecost and Holy Spirit, and so on on one on one on 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 one side of it, this the, there was a fire lighting up pages, but I knew those pages that were literally again the fire that fire was burning the, the past, leaving leaving those pages in like like black ash, but then. On the other side, it, the same the same kind of uh, fire, but it was a light, and it was it was a light on the pages of of the new. And I pray that on this day that we celebrate Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit will burn away the pages of the past and will shine a light, a bright light, of your testimony of God's grace on your life for the future he has for you so stop judging God stop judging others and stop judging yourself if God has called you to do it then we will be empowered to complete the work he has given us no matter what. I'm standing in this amazing room, honored that he opened this door for us to call home. And I'm grateful that on this day, it is the first time that we've gone live in a while. I thank you for being on the journey. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that on this day that we celebrate your Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, falling on 120 in an upper room. Father, I pray for that same fire to burn within us. Lord, would you burn away the pages of the past, set them on fire, let them become ashes. And I ask you to shine the bright light of your Holy Spirit on the pages that are yet to be written about our future in you. I ask you to bless your precious people this day. And again, Lord, I remind them, if you have called them, then you will empower them. Father, if you have called them, you will empower them. And I thank you for that empowerment, that empowering fuel of the Holy Spirit that he who began a good work in them will finish it and that Paul said unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit at work today in us on this day in Jesus name amen I appreciate you guys so much and I thank you for just being a part of this thank you for praying for us thank you for standing with us and I just I want to say thank you for just for those of you that have taken time to sow into this the ministry you're sowing into God's kingdom thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing so and um, I'm looking forward to all that God has in store for us in this new place. And um, look forward to the new furniture we're going to get. I I'm just looking forward to all of it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I pray that you have an amazing week. And remember, if God has called you, he's also empowered you. And don't allow self-judgment to stop you. Because your best days are ahead of you. Have a great week. Bye.